Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome everyone to the service of worship, and we pray that all who are here will receive a blessing as we worship God together this morning. Our visitors are especially welcome. We have quite a few visitors with us. We are glad that you are here. And we would invite visitors and members to please sign the friendship registers that are at the ends of each of the pews, pass them down the pews so that everyone would have an opportunity to sign this morning. As you look at the bulletin, uh, there are several announcements. Uh, please note each one of them, including the Women's Fellowship News. Uh, circles 1 and 2 are meeting on Wednesday, August the 3rd, as noted in the bulletin. And the members of the circles are reminded to bring school supplies for Spee's Elementary School. Victoria. Victoria Lastly concludes her student internship with us today. And we have certainly been blessed by her time with us. We will get an opportunity uh, to hear her preach a sermon this morning. And we'll also have an opportunity to greet her and some of her family who are with us following the worship service. So if you would like to stay around and, uh, and uh, give Victoria your blessing and your uh, good wishes. She will also be at the door at the end of the service, but also will be in the church parlor. About once a month or so, we have a moment for stewardship where we invite a, a member of the congregation to come and to talk about a ministry that they're involved in, whether in the congregation or in the community. And we're privileged today to ask Brother Don Griffin to come up and talk to us about his ministry with us, which is that of visitation pastor. Don, will you talk to us about that? Thank you. Again, good morning. Good morning. I uh, was asked by the stewardship committee to speak about visitation, and uh, then Brother Scott told me I had three to five minutes, and I thought, well, I'll say one word, go visit. <laughs> <laughs> visitation is an interesting subject. When we think about visiting, we also need to be thinking about community. We also need to be thinking about the needs of others. In Genesis 2.18, we read this. The Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And then in verses 22 and 24, we're told, the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. These passages help me to remember that humankind is divinely designed to be in community with one another. We're not made to be alone. We need one another. God made us to be with Him and to be with each other. The God of all creation desires in His most inner being to have a relationship with you and me. In Genesis, we also see in chapter 3, a glimpse of how God's design for community is corrupted along with the entire world 
when humankind falls from the grace of community with God into the hands of Satan and Satan's sly ability to tempt humankind to continue to sin. The divine design of community is broken in Genesis 3. God becomes at odds with humanity and humanity at odds with one another. We become self-centered. We forget that we are made for God and made for others. The Old Testament is filled with stories of how the community between humankind and the God of righteousness and justice is time and time again broken because of our self-centered. But listen to this. The God of grace and mercy doesn't give up. So he becomes one of us. We call him Jesus. He is the very essence of righteousness and right relationship. He comes to restore the broken communion between God and humankind and to rebuild the community between humans. He is the bridge between our sinful selves and God. <clears throat> he restores communion. His death on the cross allows God, a righteous and just Father, to accept us in our sinful state. We're saved because of what Jesus has done. Our only task to receive that salvation is to accept but amazingly most of the world yeah but not us not you and me not our brothers and sisters in Christ because we're called by his name we're called Christians. We're followers of Christ. We are the body of grace, the world in which we live. And as such, Christ has taught us how to maintain communion with God, our Father, and our human neighbors, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to these words from Matthew. Then one of the lawyers asked him a question, test him in, saying, Teacher, which are the great commandment of the law. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. In Luke, this parable is followed by another parable. The one we heard just a few days ago, our pastor preached on the parable of the Good Samaritan. As Jesus finishes that parable, he asked the young lawyer, So, which of these do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer answered, he who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. 
so here it is, the crux of today's stewardship minutes. You and I are the community of faith, and we have been commanded by our Lord, our King, not asked, but commanded to go and do likewise. Go meet the needs of others. Be community. Be a good Christian brother and sister. Go visit. It is what the Lord designed us to be about, community. We are to visit the sick, feed the hungry, bring hope to the prisoner, give those who thirst for righteous conversation a drink of consideration and kindness. Be a bearer of God concern for them. Listen to their concerns. Address their concerns as best you can. Sometimes that means simply to acknowledge their distress. Just be in their presence. Read God's Word to them. Pray with them. Lift them out of the loneliness by your presence. That's our calling. That's who we are. We are Christian children of God community of faith. And you may be saying, preacher, I don't have that gift. And beside that, we pay you to do it. You make a good point. You do pay me to do it. But it's not just my job. God needs assistance. Every pastor. People like it when preachers come to their home. But folks, I am a member of this congregation. And I know this congregation. And when I visit with people in this congregation, you are known to them. They understand your love for them. They understand your ministry to them. I am pleased pleased to be a member of a congregation that cares. Can we do more? Yes, we can do more. But we are doing something right. And I just ask you to don't be deceived by Satan's lies because he puts doubts in your mind about your ability to help people about your ability to do anything. When he says to you, you can't do this, I want you to remember one thing. Jesus says, yes, you can. And remember this. Our Savior doesn't lie. God of truth. He is truth. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as shepherd divides His sheep from the goat. And He will set the sheep on His right hand but the goat on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, clothed. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothed? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And our king will answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brother, God, God. Uh, 
Thank you, Don. As we move to our prayer time this morning, we lift up prayers to God who hears and acts on our prayers out of his great love for us. Let us pray. O Lord, you have graciously blessed us with a good world of many resources. We thank you for all the blessings of this life, our family, our home, our job, our friends, and our possessions. All this has come from your generous heart, and we are grateful. God of mercy and comfort, be especially with all who need your restoring strength and peaceful calm this morning. We particularly ask your sustaining presence to be with Alden Dahl, Ann and David Marcus, Danny Ferguson, Bob and Billy Minish, Doug Cook, Pam Tatum, a family dealing with the suicide, the family of Lena Brandt. Uphold them in your loving arms, we pray. We do give thanks, God of all, for a meaningful and enjoyable vacation Bible school last week. May all of us be inspired by the message of following Jesus, the light of the world. Heavenly Father, help each of us to see the infinite value of your love for us. And in seeing, help us hold this treasure more dear than all else. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. to turn to our book of worship for the liturgy of thanksgiving found on page 159. Let us stand as we pray our liturgy together. Almighty and gracious God, you have made yourself known to us in a multitude of ways. And each of those ways invites us to respond to you with grateful hearts. You have, have been, been present, present with us even before our thoughts and words and feelings ever turned toward you. You created us in your own image, redeemed us with your love, and have always sustained us with your grace. When we think of you, gracious God, we think of your compassion and tender mercies toward us all, and we are humbled with gratitude. may be seated. We thank you, ever-present God, 
for coming to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, for entering into our human flesh and taking the form of a servant. We thank you for reaching the least of us while we were yet sinners and for doing all things necessary for our salvation through the sufferings, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We praise and honor you with our hearts and our lives because we know that we cannot help ourselves or earn our own salvation. You continue to rush out to meet us and embrace us while we are yet far off. We marvel at the depth of your forgiving love which always comes to us through the working of your spirit. We thank you for each new experience and each new reminder of your very constant care. us to live alone in this world, but have called us to be members of your body, the church. We thank you for all those in the past who shared their faith with us, and for those in the present who helped to shape our response to your love. We are grateful for the nurture we receive and the mission we have been given to manifest the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. You have not left us without written and living testimony to your involvement in human history. We thank you for the Holy Script and the insights they provide for us in our mission and ministry. We are grateful for the words and stories of judgment and justice, comfort and renewal, salvation and peace that come to us from the Bible and from the ongoing inspiration of your Holy Spirit. creation itself and the nourishment we receive from its resources for seed time and harvest, sunshine and rain, ocean and forest, for the wondrous way in which we are woven into the environment. We give you thanks, Creator God, for all the creative things we are enabled to do through the gifts and talents you have given to us, for the good health within our body, mind, and spirit for the courage and healing that you provide when we are broken and discouraged in the midst of our earthly pilgrimage. We acknowledge with thanks your leadership in our journey, for the gift of time and the guidance you give for the redemptive use of our day, for the satisfaction and renewal that come from our labor and leisure, for directing us to do justice and to love mercy, for the chance to begin again whenever we falter and fail. We are grateful, our Savior, whose faithfulness endures through all generations. 
Let us stand. Gracious God, the words of contrition that we pray in the light of, of your manifold blessing. We that we avail to receive your glory as it is revealed in creation. We have taken the gifts of this world for granted and have not stopped to marvel at what you have provided for us. Forgive us for rushing through life with reckless abandon. Forgive us for trampling upon other persons, places, and things, and for not understanding how dependent we are upon one another and the earth itself. Help us, Creator God, to share the resources of this world as good and faithful stewards. Show us how to tend the land, water, and air, and to prevent their pollution and destruction. Teach us the discipline of conserving what we have used. Deliver us from exploitation. Keep us from idolizing money and material possessions. And make us compassionate in our concern for the needs of others. Amen. God hears our prayers blots out our transgressions, and creates a new and right spirit within us. Go in peace and joyful service. one another in Christ's name. God's steadfast love and faithfulness is given to us daily and abundantly. And in response, we have an opportunity to bring forth our offerings.
Let us pray. Generous God, today we offer ourselves to you. Make us good stewards of the talents, time, and wealth you have put in our care. Help us use your riches wisely, fairly, and generously for the good of the world and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. may be seated. Thank you. It is time for the children's message so the children can come up front with Kathy.
big kids. Big kids. Wow. Oh, it's a pop log. Good. All right. Yes. I was really disappointed this morning. I thought, there's not going to be any up here for me. But good morning. I'm glad to have everybody this morning. I wanted to talk about something. I know Miss Victoria is going to preach this morning. I miss her so bad because she has been such a blessing to all of us. So, uh, with saying that, I wanted to ask you, and I know you all know this, we're talking about choices this morning in, in our sermon. Miriam Webster defines choices as the act of picking or deciding between two or more possibilities. The opportunity or power to make a decision. Well, that brought to mind an old, old TV program called Let's Make a Deal. Now then, I'm going to age myself. I thought this was a great game show. Anybody familiar? Here with Let's Make a Deal? Yes. I know you are, because you're old enough. So, you know, yeah, I'm worn. <laughs> but, you know, what they did is they had contestants come up, and they were all dressed in crazy outfits. And they would call them to the front, and they would have three boxes on the stage. Let's Make a Deal. Which box do you want? Box number one? box number two, or box number three. And so people chose a box. Now then, at the end of the show, the two guests that had won prizes had the choice of carton number one, number two, or number three. There might have been a goat there might have been a boat, there might have been a huge vacation, and there may have been nothing. They had to make a choice in which curtains they wanted. And that choice and their decision determined what they received or they didn't receive. Now, my point this morning is this. We all have to make choices. We can make good choices in life sometimes we may think it's a good choice and it turns out to be not a good choice but they're ours to make Jesus gives us the opportunity to make choices you make choices to go visit sick you make choices to come to church or not we make choices in life over little things and big things every day. But, you know, the one thing that stood out the most to me was, I believe it's in Proverbs, it talks about the gold, the fine gold and silver. And we can't take those worldly possessions with us. Because when we make the choice to follow Jesus, and to do the things that he wants us to do. We'll be blessed. We will have things in heaven that will be greater than the finest gold that there is or the most shiny silver that there is. We will receive the gift of eternal life living with our Lord and Savior. And that will be based on the choices that we make. With that, this morning, I will ask that we bow our heads and have a prayer, and then I have treats for all of you this morning. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear Lord, we know humans sometimes we don't make all the best choices in the world, but again, that's part of life, and we ask that in following you, you give us and help us and allow us to make good choices, the choices to follow you and your teaching, to love one another and to show that love to each and every person that we come in contact with. We ask this 
in your most blessed name. Amen. Now you can have some candy. And you can go back to your seats. <laughs> First reading is from Psalm chapter 49, verses 1 through 9. This can be found in your Pew Bibles on page 451. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. Your mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the inequity of my persecutor surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boost of the abundance of their riches. Truly, no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it. For the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice. That one should live on forever and never see the grave. Our second reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This can be found on page 957 of your few Bible. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming to those who are disobedient. These are the ways... You also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Sicilian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. Now if you would stand and we'll sing... Him, I search for you, Lord, which is on your green insert in the bulletin.
The other day, I was reading an article of a lady who had been struggling to find a full time since 2011. And after years of being in and out of work, she finally found a steady part time job. And at her part time job last month, the opportunity came up for her to make an internal transition and receive a full time spot. But after her employer received her application, they told her that if she wanted the position, her availability would have to change. But you see, she was available Monday through Saturday, all day, every day, but not Sundays. And her employer continued to tell her that this position would require her to work on Sunday mornings. But for her, she could not miss church. She was so involved in her church, teaching Sunday school, singing in the choir, and other various forms of ministry that her church offered. She refused the job. She had a choice to make. After five years of struggling to find work and going to church, what would she do? This is what she's been waiting for after all, and it's right here in front of her. And her employer told her that she could just find a Sunday evening service or a Wednesday evening service to go to. But she let him know that her church did not offer that. She could only go to church on Sunday mornings. She chose her church. But the beautiful part about her choice to choose church is that tomorrow she starts another full-time position. Her employer found her a way to work full-time somewhere else at her current job. There are times in our life where we question the choices that we make. They are hard And they are scary. And this woman had to face a very hard and scary choice in a matter of minutes, sitting in a conversation with her employer. At the end of this article, she said, I guess I needed to show God that he is a priority for me. And he showed me that I am a priority for him. And I share this with you because we are all living in a world where our choices matter. Each and every choice and decision that we make has to be carefully and thoroughly thought through. And oftentimes, we only have minutes to make them. We don't get to go home and simmer on them for an hour or a day. It's a quick-paced world where we need to think more. I need to be totally honest about the decisions and choices that I make sometimes. I don't often take a moment to say, hey, God, I need you in this. I just make a decision and move on with my day. And that's okay. Because you and I both know that in these moments, we don't have to actively invite God to be present in them. God is currently participating and will always be present in everything we do whether we ask for him or not. And as Christians here in 2016, there are people every day choosing not to allow God to be present in their life. We see it every day. And seeing this can make it harder for us to want to continue to invite God into our choices. Inviting God in and stepping out on our faith can be the most terrifying and life-giving experience all at the same time. Three weeks ago, I found myself sitting on top of a mountain at Laurel Ridge with 160 high school students. Our program for the week was titled Decisions 2016 and was used to encourage these young people, including the counselors, to rethink about our choices and how we make them. Why do we make these choices? How do we make them? Where is God in our decision-making process? And what's our answer for where God and for what God's choice is for where we are in our life right now? 
Is it a yes? Is it a no? Or is it a maybe? And on Friday morning, each young person and counselor alike had the opportunity to answer that question anonymously on a ballot. We put it in a clear bin, we mixed it up, and we pulled one ballot out for the answer of the entire camp for the question of where are we on our walk with God. We had a choice to make. The leadership team had a choice to make for that week as well. Do they rig the system, automatically pull a yes to make the campers happy, and just go home the next day? No. They chose to keep it honest. And they prayed and prayed, and they decided to pick a hymn and a scripture for the yes, for the no, and for the maybe. So that these young people can see that no matter what their answer is on their anonymous ballot in that bin, God is present for them and for us. And the ballot that was pulled out of the bin was a yes. And as emotions filled the room, I could not only wait in anticipation to see the scripture that was going to be put up on the screen, but I looked around and saw what was taking place. And when the scripture was read out loud to the camp, it became clear to me that I needed to make the choice to bring that message to you today. The scripture was a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 16 through 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. We've been talking a lot about relationships already this morning in a community, and we hear the words of Jesus clearly here in chapter 15 talking about relationships between him and the Father, between him and us, between us and the Father. It's a big relationship triangle, if you will. As we go back to the beginning of chapter 15, we hear Jesus' words leading up to the greatest commandment, to love one another as the Father loves us. And we continue to hear the words of Jesus speaking to the community telling him that they are his friends. Close enough friends that he is willing to keep it as real as it gets and as honest with them. Because you see, Jesus made the choice to not hold back when the Father made things known to him. Jesus lets us know, as well as the community, when the text was written, that we are close enough friends with him that he was willing to lay his life down for us, to show us what it is like to love one another just as the Father loves him. Relationships. Four years ago, I had the honor of being a young and very stubborn counselor at Laurel Ridge, under the leadership of Scott and Liz, as they were the deans of junior camp. And I have been blessed to be their counselor at camp under their leadership for three years, and next week being the fourth. But each year I felt like I had built a relationship with them and started a new friendship. Felt very comfortable having conversations with them about life and the ministry, not knowing that I would be here where I am now. But now that I think about it, we never really talked about sports. And I don't know if it's because you're a Tar Heel and I'm a Deacon or what that looks like, but it it just never seemed to come up. That's right, good. But I will say we have had a lot of good conversation. And when I learned that I needed to do a congregational internship and couldn't do it at my home church, I was faced with a choice. One that I had to make within a couple weeks. Where was I going to go? Who did I want to learn from? 
What would be best for me? Where would I grow the most? And of course, Scott just happens to be right here at Fairview, across from Wake Forest, the prime location. It just all fell like dominoes. Talk about God being active in a situation, bringing relationships together over time. God is and was all over this and will continue to be. And I'm sure you guessed that Scott and I did have a conversation in those weeks. But I'm not sure if you knew this. Scott did not ask me to come to Fairview. I asked Scott to come here. The candidacy committee did not ask me to come here. I asked for their approval. The PEC did not know that I was coming here until they received my request for approval. And our conversation kind of sounded like this. Scott, how would you like having an intern next year? You know, I have to get it done, and uh, I just need to know. What do you say? Well, it's clear that I got a yes because I'm right here right now and have been here for 11 months, but I will say we did not realize a nine-month internship would turn into 11 months and some. And although my internship has come to a close, I am beyond happy to say that I am not losing Scott as my mentor or my connections with this community as I enter my third year of graduate school. You will all be part of my education next year in multiple ways. And I'm very happy to say that. I made this choice. I chose Fairview Moravian Church for my internship. And I don't like coming in on a blank slate and knowing nothing, but for some reason I was okay with it here. I was ready to grow. But I'm sure y'all didn't realize how busy you would be over these past 11 months putting up with me either. You have been busy gardening, if you didn't know it. Your hands have been working hard, and I was your seat. Last August, when I arrived, you began the tilling. As you introduced yourself to me, the tiller began to turn slowly moving the soil around, allowing it to breathe and be ready to be fed so it could stay rich. You delicately took your hands and placed me in the center with lots of room to grow and flourish. When you began to share your stories with me, you fed the soil, allowing the seed to sprout roots so deep into the ground and help me start my journey here with a strong foundation. When you invited me to functions and offered me an opportunity to participate alongside you, you gave me more opportunities to improve, allowing me the ability to break ground and grow a trunk, a trunk that reached for the sun and wanted more. As you offered me words of encouragement and affirmed my active participation here at Fairview, you allowed me the opportunity to grow branches and leaves. When you allowed me to sit at the bedside of your loved ones during hospital visitations and going to the assisted living facilities, when you welcomed me into your homes, when you confided in me, I began to bear fruit. When you let me work with your children, when you let me bring new ideas into this church, and when you listened to me share some of my experiences, the fruit on my tree became a diverse assortment and multiplied. When you extended a helping hand, exemplified love towards me and towards one another, my roots dug a little deeper, 
and I learned a whole lot more. With your hands and your hearts and your minds, you have done all of this. Collectively, as a loving and faithful community, as you have given me the opportunity to grow, you have planted your own seeds in the garden alongside me, growing and learning from each other and experiencing new things. I have enjoyed so much being part of this community. I feel spiritually energized more than I have felt in years. And from the moment I walked in those double doors, I was immersed in a space full of people who were willing to help navigate and teach a young girl who had absolutely no idea what she was doing. From getting up for my first message, absolutely terrified, sitting in meetings, laughing with you, home and hospital visitations with stories and memories of this place that go years and years and years. I have been given so much. Starting new friendships, experiencing young ones taking their first communion, having the opportunity to serve my first communion here. All of these things have been eye-opening experiences for me and have left me with a new outlook on what I want my ministry to look like. But I can't forget the first love feast I had here. Sitting right there, I never realized how awkward it would be to sit and face the congregation while trying to eat a love feast bun and drink coffee without making a mess. It is so much easier sitting beside y'all, but in front of you is completely different. Today I will leave here equipped with so many things. Today I will leave here with the confirmation that being here in a congregational setting, serving in the ministry, is where I am called to be. I have never felt so rich in love and support from a faith community as I have here. But most importantly, in the moments where I have struggled and kind of fallen short a little bit, you guys have loved me through it all. You've picked me up and put your hands on my back and told me to keep on going and you'll get through it, it'll be okay. And I can't thank you enough for everything in the past 11 months. But I am so excited to see what our future holds and to find out what we are going to go through together. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me our closing hymn this morning. Hymn number 641, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Before our benediction, uh, we have a little presentation to make. Victoria didn't know about this, but on behalf of the congregation, Victoria, we have a gift to give to you and our appreciation for all you have done with us, and you have been a blessing to us, and uh, we trust we've been a blessing to you, and our thoughts and prayers go with you uh, as the Lord calls you to his service. Yes. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen.